Hello! Welcome back to New Scientist Weekly, your curated selection of the week's science stories. I'm Timothy Revel in New York. And I'm Christy Taylor, currently somewhere in Wisconsin. Today, we've got a climate change special. We'll be making sense of the hottest July on record, checking in with the climate models to see if what we're experiencing now was to be expected, and we'll be taking a good look at genuine causes for optimism. Together, it adds up to a perfect guide for how to understand the climate moment we are having right now. Also on the show, we're telling you what you need to know about the new Eris COVID variant and why aliens on low oxygen planets, if there are any, may be doomed to low tech lives. Plus, we've got an update on Ertzi the Iceman's hairstyle. Now it is official. July 2023 was the hottest month on record. And this year's overall global average temperature is shaping up to be the hottest ever measured. That comes along with local heat records falling all over the world, from Phoenix, Arizona, to the Gulf of Mexico, to China. As a result, we've seen collapsing cactuses, bathtub hot ocean water, bleaching coral, wildfires, and more consequences to ecosystems and people. This is all part of a story that can easily become too much to handle, but it is the story of our lifetimes. I mean climate change, and all the many things we're learning about how much the world is warming, how fast, and with what consequences. It's huge, right? A phenomenon that threatens economies and health, agriculture, the mere ability to choose where we live. And it can feel sometimes like the only options are to deny it, ignore it, or succumb to doom and depression. But the reality is more complicated, and thankfully a bit more hopeful than we give it credit for. Climate change is a product of human choices, which means we can still make changes and choices that head off the worst consequences. In this climate special, which is mirroring one we have running in the magazine and on our website this week, we want to spend some time looking at that reality, whether it's as bad as it feels after a truly extraordinary July and where the pieces of good news and the choices you can act on are coming from. I've got reporter James Deneen with me in the New York studio to help us understand the many extreme weather events we saw last month. So, hi, James. Hello. James, you've been speaking with a bunch of climate scientists to understand why this year, and July especially, has been so hot. What's been driving it? So there are two main reasons for these extreme temperatures this year. The first you have to think about is the background warming effect of humans releasing more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And the second is the shift to a warm El Nino climate pattern in the Pacific Ocean after a stretch of cool years in the Pacific. And those two factors together can explain the lion's share of the heat this year, although natural variability and other factors may also be behind local extremes. What are some of those other factors? So, for instance, the July heat waves that occurred simultaneously in North America, Southern Europe, and China were all boosted by a wavy jet stream pattern that formed these heat domes of trapped hot air. There's some question about whether these wavy jet streams are themselves made more likely by climate change, but they also happen naturally. And then there's also been a lot of discussion among researchers about the role of some more speculative factors in driving regional extremes. For instance, there's some talk about a deficit of sand blown off the Sahara Desert, which usually has a reflective effect over the ocean. There's also been a reduction in sulfur emissions from shipping since 2020, which can make clouds darker, especially over shipping corridors. And even the eruption early last year of a volcano near the Pacific island of Tonga could have had a marginal global warming effect by injecting a huge amount of water vapor into the stratosphere, which is a greenhouse gas. Yeah, we can't exactly stop volcanoes or even predict them. Um, it seems like it's probably good to reduce shipping emissions in general, but there are all these factors. Not all of them are climate change, but together they still seem to be having these really huge consequences for us, right? We can't really deny that. Exactly. The heat is a consequence of piling all these factors together. And it becomes even more complicated when you start to ask questions about how all these factors are affecting one another. For instance, there's been a lot of debate about how the warming effect from rising greenhouse gases might also affect cycles between El Nino and La Nina events in the Pacific. Historically, that shift has happened every two to seven years with some neutral years in between. But some researchers think that 
could change with climate change, though there's no consensus on whether that would mean more El Nino, more La Nina, or both. What about the El Nino this year? Are we going to see that start to sort of drop off anytime soon? Well, forecasting what happens in the oceans is a classically difficult problem, but it looks like there's a growing chance that the El Nino that has developed this year will continue to strengthen to the end of the year and into 2024, which could mean that next year is even hotter than this one. Which is, of course, not anything anyone likes to hear. But it also kind of begs the question for me, if we're looking at the bigger picture of climate change, how does what's happening stack up against the research? So we're bringing in reporter Michael LePage. He's also here joining us from London. Hey, Michael. Hi. So you've been reporting on why our picture of the pace and impacts of climate change should actually be much more nuanced than it may actually be feel at times. We see all these records falling one by one, the anticipation of more records falling. Does this actually mean the planet is warming faster than the scientists actually expected, though? Uh, no, no, it doesn't. So the the long term increase in the average global surface temperature that we've seen is really close to what climate models have predicted for the level of emissions we've seen. So the key thing here is that, as James just said, there's this all this variability from year to year because of El Nino and volcanic eruptions, and these things are really hard or just impossible to predict. And so the analogy I like to use is it's like standing on a beach as a tide comes in. So that rise as a tide comes in is really predictable, but you can't predict when an individual wave will arrive or how big it will be. So what we've seen at the moment, this sudden spike in global temperatures, is like a really big wave is coming in and hitting the shore. Maybe there'll be another one next year, maybe there won't be. But it doesn't really mean that the tide as a whole is coming in any faster. What about extreme weather, though? Droughts, flooding, heat waves, that sort of thing. Are we, are we seeing more of that? Yeah, so the, the climate scientists I spoke to were a bit sort of uh, uncertain about that. They, they, so the answer was maybe. The reason why it's hard to answer this question is, is that climate forecasts are just that. They're forecasting the climate and climate is average weather. And so climates have been predicting more heat waves and hotter heat waves. And that's certainly what we've seen. But they haven't really been saying, looking at like individual weather events and predicting those in any detail, because that's not what the climate models are designed to do. So the, the jury is a bit out on that question still, I think. What about some of the other impacts? Are the effects on things like our health or food supplies, are they any worse or less than we had anticipated? Uh, here, there's another very clear answer, and it's yes. And we can say that very clearly, because in fact, the latest reports from the IPCC explicitly said that the impacts are turning out to be worse than they had projected in their early reports. And these are impacts such as coral reefs dying, people being killed, islands vanishing under the seas, species going extinct, food shortages, financial knock-on, stuff like that. And what I hadn't really grasped before doing this last bit of reporting is not only do these latest reports say that the impacts are greater than we thought, what's really worrying is they say the societies are more vulnerable to these impacts and also that adapting to them is more difficult than we thought. Interesting. So the warming is turning out to be about what was predicted, but it looks like those impacts of it will be harder on us than we had thought, which is obviously far from ideal. Yep. Another thing people often speak about are tipping points where rather than a change happening more gradually, you reach a certain threshold and suddenly you just get this drastic flip that's very hard to come back from. How are we doing on those? Well, there's a huge amount of uncertainty here, but the last IPCC report says that the risks of these tipping points are a bit higher than they'd assessed to be the case previously. So we're talking here about things like the Amazon rainforest dying off. These are catastrophic changes that can't be reversed in our lifetimes or even our grandchildren's lifetimes if they happen. Okay, so that is a couple of quite big blows on the impacts and the tipping points. But I think it's fair to say that throughout the climate special, we're not seeing that everything is bad news. James, you've been looking particularly at that side of the story. What are the signs for optimism? Well, one silver lining to all these extremes is that they could help build some political momentum to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, perhaps adding to a sense of urgency. But probably the best concrete news has to do with the speed and scale at which renewable energy is being built, which is setting records as well. This year is expected to see by far the largest ever addition of wind and solar energy capacity globally, with 440 gigawatts expected to be added just this year, according to the International Energy Agency. And then add to that 
record adoption of electric vehicles and other decarbonizing progress means the world could be on course for fossil fuel emissions to peak by 2025, according to some modeling. In fact, emissions from the global power sector may already have crested, according to some other reports. I find these numbers really exciting, James, and I'm especially thrilled to hear that emissions from burning fossil fuels could peak in as few as three years. Why is this renewable boom happening now, though? Well, the cost of renewable energy has been falling for years and has become even cheaper than expected. Some of it is also down to new policies in the world's biggest emitting countries. China, for instance, emits more than any other country, but it has also been building wind and solar faster than anywhere else to meet its targets of peaking emissions by 2030 or earlier. One impressive stat I found, more than half of all new renewables built in 2023 are expected to be built in China. In the U.S., there's also a lot happening. The U.S. is the world's second largest emitter, but emissions here look likely to be cut in half by 2035 compared to 2005 levels, helped along by new policies like the Inflation Reduction Act, which just this week is a year old. And the European Union, which is the fourth largest emitter after India, is also spending hundreds of billions of euros to cut emissions and reduce dependence on fossil fuels. And that has been somewhat accelerated by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Right, because Russia has been such a major gas supplier for the EU. But that's still such encouraging news. Just build more things. You make it sound easy peasy. Yeah, I don't I I don't mean to. I was given the I was given the good news job. Um, <laughs> even if emissions from burning fossil fuels were to peak in a few years, there are still other massive sources of emissions to deal with, such as from agriculture or deforestation. And some ways we use fossil fuels, such as in aviation or heavy industry, are much more difficult to replace than generating electricity or transportation. Yeah, there's there's always that kicker for sure. As a final thought, we all here as part of our jobs think about climate change a lot. And personally, I find when talking to others about it that some of the most common reactions are either complete doom and gloom, which we've mentioned, or people just burying their heads in the sand and trying to forget about it completely, which I totally understand. But it feels so important to me to both stay engaged and to not give up hope. Michael, you've so much experience covering these topics for New Scientist. How do we talk about them in a way that is both grounded in reality, but also leaves us enough optimism to make the most of the opportunities we actually do have to make a positive change. Yeah, I think I think that's really tricky. And I I wouldn't pretend to to have the answers for sure. I mean, I think as a journalist, I feel it's our job to tell people the truth. And the truth is actually pretty bad. You know, our emissions are still rising. It's very clear the world's going to zoom past the 1.5 degree Paris target in the next decade or so. And I think it's also becoming clear that there's zero chance of the world achieving net zero by 2050 because of those hard cut emissions that uh, James mentioned. But I I think also, you know, when you say things like this, people just go, oh, well, we're doomed then and we we can't do anything to give up all hope. And that's completely the wrong response because it's not true at all. So while some things are not unavoidable, most of what's going to happen is still very much in our hands. When I started reporting on climate, we were heading for something like five degrees Celsius by 2100. And now it's forecast to be more like three degrees C, which is a massive change. And if we do more, we can still get it down to sort of two degrees or maybe even a bit less. So there's everything to fight for still. And and what we do really matters and is really important. I think the problem is that people have this tendency to think of the future in very binary terms. So that either it's a sort of glorious place where everything is better and wonderful, or it's this apocalyptic wasteland where everything's gone to hell. But in reality, of course, there are trillions of possible futures in between those two extremes. And which of those futures we end up in is entirely dependent on us. Thank you so much for joining us, Michael, and to you too, James. Thanks. Thank you. You can read more about James and Michael's specific reporting projects in our magazine and on our website this week. And that's where you'll also find what we're learning about attributing specific extreme events to climate change, why doom can be as harmful to progress as denial, and how humans may adapt at least somewhat to higher temperatures. Thanks also to editor Jacob Aaron, who did loads of the work making the climate special happen. You can read the full series at newscientist.com. 
And now, a brief interruption to suggest that you listen to some other things too. But of course, still from us, New Scientist. If you aren't already on the Dead Planet Society bandwagon, well, now is the time. That's where space reporter Leah Crane and senior editor Chelsea White teach you how to destroy this planet or another planet of your choosing. And in this week's episode, we're using gravitational waves to bend the Earth into oblivion. And that's already right there in your feed, ripe for the taking. And coming soon, if you are looking for TV recommendations for your next quiet night in, after you've had a long day of destroying the Earth, we've got you covered. TV columnist Bethan Ackerley joined me and Tim to give us her top picks, from science fiction to medical ethics to the unembellished drama of the natural world. There have been loads of good documentary series out this year. So the first was a show called Wild Isles. It's so beautiful. It's so beautifully made. I defy you to find any other show where you can see something as weird and beautiful as slugs having sex there's nothing like it has aired <laughs> this year i don't think that's coming on tuesday and if you love all these shows by the way and want to give us a bit of extra support please give us a rating or review on apple podcasts and spotify algorithms for the algorithm gods it really does make a difference Finally, for anyone living nearish to London, we've got something I'm personally pretty gutted to be missing, and it's a one-day masterclass for understanding the equations that explain the universe. It's on September the 2nd, and will be a fascinating journey through Newton's laws of gravity, E equals MC squared, Pythagoras, and more. For more information on that, please visit newscientist.com slash equations. Next, COVID-19 cases are once again on the rise in several countries around the world, including the UK, US and China. Accounting for an increasing number of those cases is an Omicron subvariant that the World Health Organization named a new variant of interest just last week. Here to tell us about EG5, or ARIS, as some people are calling it, is our biomedical editor, Alexandra Thompson, who's dialing in from London. Hi, Alex. Hello. It's been a while since we've had a new subvariant, but Presumably, this was inevitable. The virus is still out there, so it's still going to have opportunities to mutate and to spread. Yes, it was only a matter of time. The virus is constantly evolving. And as long as it's still circulating through our population, it will have opportunities to mutate into new variants and subvariants. Eris or Eris, sorry, my pronunciation might not be right, but that's actually the Greek goddess of, of chaos and discord, which is quite fitting for COVID-19, really. It's a nickname that started on Twitter, or should I say X, and has gathered steam. I do kind of like having a memorable name for these things. It does feel mm. like the subvariant phase has taken us pretty firmly away from the days when the epidemiologists were promising to use like this Greek letter system to tell the variants apart. Um, and then we got back to the like letter number salad. So again, I'm, I'm a fan of Eris. <laughs> but it also seems like just yesterday that we were watching the Omicron surge, which was actually almost two years ago. What do we know about Eris? It was first reported in mid-February, and as Tim just said, it's been designated a variant of interest by the World Health Organization. It has an additional amino acid mutation in its spike protein compared with the parent subvariant it evolved from. And how widespread is it? I mean, we know wastewater tracking and other data have pointed to COVID itself rising around the world. How much of that is Eris? It's a growing proportion. As of the 7th of August, more than 7,000 sequences of ERIS had been submitted to the Global Initiative on Sharing All Influenza Data, and that came from 51 countries, which includes the US, the UK and Australia. Towards the end of June, it made up 7.6% of all reported SARS-CoV-2 cases globally, and a month later it was 17.4%. You mentioned that EG5 or ARIS, it's got a mutation in the spike protein, which is of course the thing that lets the virus enter our cells and infect us. Do we know anything about the particular advantages that this particular mutation might give the virus? Well, it's early days, but research is suggesting that this mutation makes it better at spreading to new people compared with the previously dominant variants and Omicron subvariants. It also affects how antibodies neutralize the virus, which may enable it to overcome immunity brought about by a previous SARS-CoV-2 infection or from vaccines. So it sounds a bit concerning, but mm. there's, you also had quite a few suggests and mays in there. Mm -hmm. So how concerned should we be about it? Well, OK, overall, the World Health Organization has judged its health risk to be low and on par with other Omicron subvariants. I mean, there's no evidence it causes more severe symptoms. But what are the symptoms, you know, that it does cause? Is it the same same ones we've seen before? Is there something new or a new pattern? 
It's the same, so commonly a fever, a cough, fatigue, loss of taste and smell. You may also have a sore throat, maybe a headache, muscular aches and pains, maybe diarrhea, rashes, eye irritation, and then in more severe cases, possibly difficulty breathing. But most cases are mild and they resolve in a week or two. I had not heard about eye irritation as a COVID symptom before. (laughs) Thank you, Alex. So I'm someone who's continued to wear masks in crowded spaces, on transit and so on. This rise in cases kind of makes me feel like I need to step that up again in other spaces, too. Is there anything we should keep in mind about protecting ourselves at this moment? It's the same advice for COVID-19 that we've been hearing for years now. It's, it's keep up to date on your vaccines if you're eligible. And I'm speaking from the UK and there are some new doses coming out for certain um, population groups. And depending where you are, it's going to vary geographically. But keep up to date on your vaccines. A little extra hand washing probably doesn't hurt. You can wear a mask if you're in an indoor public space and you're particularly concerned. But there's not Eris specific advice. All right, we've got a life form of the week now. Kind of, sort of, hypothetically, it is aliens. And a fascinating new study that examines how the most common planets we have found to date that could harbor life may also be the least hospitable to technology, and therefore tech bros, I would assume. It all comes down to oxygen. Alex Wilkins is here to explain. Hey, Alex. Hello. So, Alex, why are we talking about technology and aliens and whether they have enough oxygen. Yeah, so everyone knows that the only intelligent life that we know about, which is on Earth, needs oxygen to survive. And that exact level has been studied for quite a long time by astrobiologists. But there's another factor that might need to be taken into account here, which has been a little less examined. That's according to a pair of astrobiologists who did this work, Adam Frank and Amadeo Balbi. They say that without combustion or the ability to set fire to things, an intelligent alien species will never be able to extract metals from ore, otherwise known as smelting, and so they'll be unable to develop the kind of technology that we've relied on here on Earth for millennia, and also they'd never get to the point of sending a signal that we might receive and detect them with. Now, this level of oxygen required for combustion is different from the level required just to form life, and this is something that needs a lot more attention from the community when it comes to looking for alien worlds, they say. I love this, just the idea that there could be some intelligent life out there, but unfortunately the oxygen levels are not quite right for them to have amazing technology too, and we'll we'll never know about them. What is the technology-friendly oxygen level that these researchers say you need to be able to come up with technology? I'm glad you asked. It's about 18%. (laughs) Anything below that and things won't properly combust, although you might need to add a couple more percent to really make sure things are burning properly. On Earth, we have this sweet spot of about 21% oxygen, which some laboratory studies have shown that is just makes things burn really well and there are no sort of other processes going on. Now, if you go too high, above about 30%, then you're actually at risk of burning the entire planet if you were to set something on fire. <laughs> uh, obviously, we wouldn't want that. Do we know of any other atmospheres with that just right amount of oxygen in them? The not setting it on fire, but not so little that you can't smelt. Sadly not. We, we haven't actually detected any atmospheres with oxygen in them so far. Astronomers are hoping that they might get lucky with a planet that's big enough and hot enough and using the latest telescope technology like the James Webb Space Telescope, but we're still a ways off detecting it for something like a planet like Earth. Did the authors explore, though, you know, I, I feel like life finds a way, maybe technology can find a way that we just haven't imagined. Are, are there ways to develop smelting or iPhones without oxygen atmospheres or combustion yeah so obviously we can't say for sure because the only case study we have is on earth but this was a a slight criticism or or maybe a lack of the work that some other scientists i spoke to had of the idea they said you can think of life emerging in other ways than it did on earth and if it evolved differently on other planets then they might have also come up with alternative systems of smelting like they could take geothermal heat sources like volcanoes or underwater vents and use that to extract the metals or they could even fashion some lens system to concentrate a star's light and use that to burn it of course that's all much less useful and portable than just taking some wood or coal and using it wherever you want to but it is conceivable and it could also make some really cool sounding sci-fi Yeah, I really feel like some of the best sci-fi comes from imagining things that are just so far outside the scope of human experience in in ways like this. I would totally read that book. But 
If we don't find many atmospheres like Earth, that might also say something about why we haven't found any evidence of other advanced intelligent life too, right? Um, you know, we keep looking and looking and we haven't found anything. Maybe, maybe there are no signals out there because of oxygen. Yeah, exactly. So if the oxygen bottleneck does prove to be a limiting factor, then Frank and Balby suggest it might help solve this thing called the Fermi paradox, which is a famous paradox that was come up with by Enrico Fermi in the 19th century. And he said, if the universe is so vast and life is apparently likely, given what we know about it, then why are there no signals from alien civilizations? I guess in this case, one solution could be if this level of oxygen is actually very rare, then that might be a limiting factor and it, it might mean that uh, that's why we're not hearing from anybody. I'm just going to keep my hopes out for like giant magnifying glass based technology and maybe we'll still make friends. Me too. I think I think that's the most likely scenario in, in this case. <laughs> <laughs> As always, there's been a lot of other fascinating science and technology news this week, including we're learning more about the Iceman known as Ertzi. Ertzi, my favorite murdered tattooed guy from 5,300 years ago. I mean, surely he is everyone's favorite murdered tattoo guy from 5,300 years ago. <laughs> it is quite a small list. Those tattoos, by the way, they're the oldest we've ever seen. And Ertzi is Europe's oldest known naturally preserved mummy. He was naturally preserved in the frozen Alps, and he is continuing to give new insights into the lives of prehistoric Europeans. But it now turns out that the researchers who first published his genome may have gotten it a little wrong. Instead of a very mixed ancestry, including farmers and hunter-gatherers and a third group from the Eurasian steppe, he was perhaps 90% descended from Middle Eastern farmers. He was also almost certainly bald and had much darker skin than contemporary white Europeans. That seems like such a big change from what we thought we knew about him. How did we figure this out, Tim? Well, we've gotten much better techniques for genomic research now. And that means the ability to detect those for skin pigmentation or male pattern baldness are just a lot better. And it also fits what we know about Ertzi and the history of skin pigmentation in Europe. Being pale is actually a pretty new thing. And he was preserved with very little hair found. And as for the ancestry bit, well, there was always some confusion about that because the steppe people weren't in Europe until after Ertzi's lifetime. And it's now thought that perhaps the original sequencing got contaminated, which explains how they got it wrong the first time around. Well, justice and truth for Ertzi. I'm really glad to hear that we're starting to get more sort of intricate understanding into who he was. But, you know, I know he was found with that arrow or spear wound in his body, are we ever going to find out who murdered him? I think we've got to wait for the true crime podcast for that, <laughs> but definitely one I would listen to. I would listen to it too. Okay, I've got one now about a hot new cover of a classic rock song made by AI reading people's minds. <laughs> of course, because why not? Yeah, Tim, this story has everything. But the big takeaway is that we've got another advance in reconstructing something a person is experiencing all by analyzing their brain data. Researchers have begun to do this with pictures people are looking at or sounds they're listening to. Now our research team from the University of California has gotten a fairly passable recreation of a Pink Floyd song. Uh, that song is Another Brick in the Wall, Part 1, and it goes, We don't need no education. We don't need no thought control. I'm not going to sing it, which sounds like a deliberate choice. Hey, robots, leave those brains alone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very sorry. I don't really know what came over me there. I agree. It, it does sound like a deliberate choice. What was the creative process? Like, how did they go about collecting the brain data? Yeah, in this case, what they did was play a 15 second clip of the song for participants, all of whom already had electrodes implanted on the surfaces of their brains to treat epilepsy, by the way, which made it easy for the researchers to take readings from specific areas of the brain and then identify which areas were reacting to the pitch, rhythm, melody, etc. So for comparison, Here's that 15 second clip they listened to, but kind of cleaned up to make it easier to compare to the electrode data. All I was just a brick in the wall. Then they used AI to reconstruct the brain readings into a waveform, which sounded like this. So you can hear there is actually a great deal of similarity. Yeah, maybe not my favorite version of the song, but <laughs> I can almost hear 
brick in a wall. Yeah, same. If you if you listen like really hard, but as you know, maybe dubious as as it sounds, this does mark major progress, especially for to give people with speech difficulties tools for communicating in the future. It will be really important to be able to understand how the brain processes and recreates the more emotional side of speech, tone, pitch, rhythms, all that good stuff that music has innately. Fascinating. I've reported and followed this sort of mind reading technology for some time, and I just find it so incredible. One of my favorite bits of research did this where you reconstructed from brain data people's dreams, which I just found incredible. Amazing. Okay, one last one from me. It's a little home improvement item. Excellent. What am I adding to my shopping wish list? Well, for the smooth talking podcaster who lives in New York City, how about a lamp that removes air pollution from your home? I mean, given the general air quality in New York City these days, I am all for this. Yeah, I think it's one I would have in my home. And it's deceptively simple and kind of brilliant, I think. So there's this copper based coating on a lampshade that gets heated by the light bulb in the lamp. And notably, the one they used in the research was an incandescent bulb. But that heat, it helps speed up a natural reaction between the copper-based coating and the air, which turns volatile organic chemicals like formaldehyde into small amounts of carbon dioxide and water. So you don't need any extra energy. And you could, in theory, you could coat any lampshade with this stuff. So my most decadent lampshade could immediately be cleaning my air for me. That's Perfect and wonderful. I will note, however, our house does not do incandescent lights because the planet. Yeah, uh, mine too, uh, for now. But <laughs> the researchers, they're looking at those light bulbs that do produce a little less heat like LEDs uh, to see whether that's something they could adapt the lampshade for. All right. One quick thing before we go. Timothy here has something to tell us. Don't you, Timothy? <laughs> I hate self-promotion so much. But yes, I guess there is something I ought to mention. Come on. Okay, 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 okay. I got a new book out and it's called The Secret Lives of Numbers and it's written by me and my dear friend, Kate Kitagawa, who is just an amazing historian of mathematics. I've got no qualms promoting her. <laughs> well, we all knew it was going to be about math, right, Tim? Of course. I mean, what else? The book uh, it isn't your usual history of mathematics, though, which is often actually pretty distorted and puts too much emphasis on a small cast of bearded Europeans, typically. But the book is our attempt at righting some of those wrongs to better describe the often very chaotic, amazing, and just beautiful history of mathematics. And it's out in the UK as of yesterday, and it will be out in the US early next year. All right, that's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. And as always, our show notes have all the links to the stories that you've heard about today. You can subscribe to our show on whatever app you're listening on. Thank you, and bye for now. Bye. This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk.